Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And together we have been reading and are today coming to the end of The Wine Dark Sea. Mike, can you catch us up, please? Where had we got to and where might this final installment take us this week? Oh, I'd be delighted. Thanks, Ian. Well, last week in the first half of Chapter 10, Stephen came aboard the surprise from an overloaded balsa boat with intelligence about three American merchantmen headed for China. They were all so excited by the prizes that the crew got to the meeting point too early and in terrible seas down there in those southern high latitudes. After being blown away in a storm, they made their way back spotted the China ships, but saw two other unknown ships in the mist. Now, they thought they saw another sail. It turned out to be an ice island right behind them with more ice appearing all around them. And that's where we left our heroes. And this time, there's Noah's Ark, action at sea, a race against an iceberg, unrelenting nature, more disaster, bad luck, multiple good spots to end the book, and a few more tales to tell. Keep an eye on your pintles. I always do. (laughs) Yes, well done. Plus, we have a great conversation with our special guest, Paul Breyers, known to nautical fiction readers as Seth Hunter, the writer of the Nathan Peake novels. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Can't wait to get into it. I'm looking forward to wrapping this story up here and seeing where we all get to. Now, we left on... Just about the most cliffhangery of O'Brien cliffhangers, the surprise was perfectly placed to attack these three China ships that they'd found south of the Diego Ramirez Islands. The ships are well beyond the islands. They're moving more into the open sea. And we heard just at the end of the previous episode, halfway into the chapter, of these two new ships seen vaguely in the mist, lying in between the surprise and these China merchantmen. And Jack thinks that the bigger of the two might be a Spanish man of war sent to deal with the Alastor. So he leans over to tell Pullings to wear ship onto a westward course, heading after the ships, when he hears the sound of what's described as a mass of ice as big as a parish church break off of the nearest iceberg and plunge into the sea. Quickly then, he changes the order from where to tack to get away more quickly, The brig now becomes clearer and clearer, more and more visible through the fog. Jack hails the brig, has Reed run up the colours, and when there's no reply, he calls out, What ship is that? Que barco esta? Forgive me for the Spanish there. We get the sarcastic reply back, Noah's Ark, 10 days out of Ararat, New Jersey, with a cackle of maniac laughter. And the brig, now clearly an American brig, turns quickly and her stern chaser sends a ball through the surprises for Stasel before the brig disappears into the mist. So clearly, not for the first time, we've got a bit of name calling and a bit of antagonism between the warring fleets here, the British and the Americans. Mount Ararat, Mike, I'm pretty sure is not in New Jersey, or do I need to learn the exits on the turnpike better than I already do? Yeah, no, no. I don't think we ever saw Eret featuring in a Sopranos episode. This is is not in New Jersey here. But it is one of the places where Noah's Ark is said to have come to rest, and it's a great in-book Easter egg. So, you know, if we remember back to St. Isidore of Sevilla, Seville, yeah, yeah. yeah, that saint that the prior up in the high Andes was, you know, kind of calling for the protection of travelers— In his 7th century etymological encyclopedia, St. Isidore had written that this is, in fact, Mount Ararat is where the Noah's Ark came to rest, and that the remains can still be found there. So great connection here, but no connection to New Jersey. That's just part of the good Yankee joke here. (laughs) I love it. Well, uh, Mike, the, the surprise then returns fire straight away. They fire into the mist after the brig. And that's not all. As the sound is still echoing between these curtains of fog, a larger dark form grows distinct and the mist is lit with a broadside. And this is the American ship now, the bigger ship. Turns out that it's a warship. And there was me, Mike, thinking 
that there were going to be no more callbacks to the Master and Commander movie. I'd, I'd completely forgotten about this until we read it this time. This scene, the broadside through the fog, the gun flashes lighting up the fog, it's taken straight, of course, t- straight from the opening minutes of the movie. And I, I love that little callback. Maybe, maybe then, now we're done with references to, that got picked up in the movie, but let's see. Fortunately, though, unlike at the beginning of the movie, not much damage is done. The American broadside's been fired on the downward roll. Most of the shot falls short, except for a ricochet from an 18-pound ball that rolls across the surprise's deck. The smoke clears, and Jack sees her there. This heavy American 38-gun frigate with a broadside weight of metal of 342 pounds and a full crew, plus chasers, plus carronades. So just in case Mm. we weren't sure, this is a really serious, overwhelmingly strong opponent here. Jack realizes that the brig could come after their disengaged side as well or rake them from astern, so he's got threats of all kinds in all directions. I might, I, I want to play with the identity of the of the frigate, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, Patrick O'Brien's done a good job. He's chosen 38 guns as, the, as the armament size of this frigate. This is one of the characteristic sizes of the famous original six frigates, the six heavy frigates commissioned by George Washington and built by Jefferson and the uh, and Secretary of the Navy, was it Knox, in the very turn of the century? Now, three of them were 44-gun frigates. Three of them were 38-gun frigates. So that means it could have been, if you want to play with their identity in the real timeline, it could have been the Congress, the Constellation, or the Chesapeake. They were the 38-gun variants. Of course, by this time, in both the real world and in our Patrick O'Brien timeline, the Chesapeake is in the hands of the British after the battle outside Boston Harbor. So if you want to play with it, this one here could have been either of the first two, the Congress or the Constellation. Now, I don't know very much about what became of the Constellation. I'm pretty sure from reading that the USS Congress went on a cruise in 1813, so around about now where we are in the timeline, off of the coast of Brazil chasing merchantmen. So in our fictional timeline, maybe this could be her, although by the end of the real world year of 1813, Congress was so damaged from her cruising her extended cruise that repairs and refits were beyond the capacity of the shipbuilding materials available in american shipyards at the time so she was actually languishing in reserve up until 1815 so maybe her maybe not ah i love that background on the american frigates ian thank you sure you know, back here with this american frigate jack i think has taken it back a little bit but still keeps his presence of mind and orders everyone to fire as they bear as he turns the ship the gun crews do so with very accurate deliberation and with a good amount of away on the ship already jack tells tom he's going to pull her around if she'll stay and ask that the larboard gunners fire one round as they bear as the sail trimmers head aloft And at point-blank range, the larboard guns fire into the American frigate, and then the gunners leap to brace round and haul aft the sheets that have been set loose here. Jack gives the course, a course that he hopes will allow them to weather the nearest iceberg on his starboard bow. He orders top gallants and weather studding sails, gathers a few men to help him load the guns. And the American frigate is shocked by the surprise's maneuver. And the round shot had had terrible effect there, point blank. And they were so close that fragments of glowing wad had lit a split cartridge on board the American, causing an explosion. Nevertheless, the American captain had brought his ship around and spread canvas quickly. He's about a mile behind and a mile east, running on a parallel course. And like Jack, the American captain is hoping that he can weather this ice island that's moving steadily northward here. Both ships are racing through the frigid sea, firing their chasers at one another, and they've got every stitch of sail their masts can bear raised. Wow. I, I might, we're back in classic, familiar O'Brien chase frigate on frigate action here. It's, it's a great feeling if we've been waiting for this for this whole book here. But uh, breathlessly, it's all happening at once. We've had maneuvers, we've had fog, we've had the broadside, and now we've got the chase. But that's not all. Jack is sailing the ship. He's, he's conning the ship from the quarter deck whilst the gunner and Tom Pullings fire the chasers from the cabin below. 
Jack feels a pain in his heart every time they strike these drifting chunks of ice. But he can't slow down. He can't risk any decrease in speed. He can't risk taking the, uh, the time to stop and ship a bow grace, a, f- a fender, uh, to protect against ice because everything is counting on him making progress fast and fast to windward to just shave around the windward corner of this big iceberg here. The text says, it was with the horror of a nightmare that he saw the calm, doom-like motion of the ice island. The vast bulk moved with the apparent ease of a cloud, and the slight expense of safe water to the windward of its tip was narrowing, narrowing every minute. Ooh. Now, Wilkins reports that the brig has altered course, the brig that they thought they'd left behind a minute or two ago. She's bearing up to cross the surprise's stern and rake her, just like Jack had been worried that she might. This would be a broadside that would run the length of the ship. Now, Jack could turn and give a broadside back to the brig in kind of preemptive self-defense, but he can't risk that pause once again in the race with the windward corner of the iceberg. So he sends his compliments to Captain Pullings and asks that he direct his attention to the brig's foremast and yard. And Mike, I'm getting echoes of the chase of the Vaxam height here. Right. <sighs> the pace of the stern chase of fire quickens. And eight shots later, the brig shoots up into the wind. We hear this roar of triumph from the guys down below serving the gun. And her square foresail comes down on deck. The four and a half mainsail of the brig helplessly out of control. A lucky shot, a crucial lucky shot here. Now, Jack, meanwhile, is gauging his leeway by looking up against a fissure in the iceberg. He's trying to judge whether the ship is drifting so far downwind that she might not make it around the windward corner of this iceberg. And he uses this phrase in his mind, it's going to be a damned near-run thing. And Mike, we've heard this phrase before, right? It's come up a few times in the canon. But I'm noticing it this time, and I'm realizing and maybe remembering for the first time that this is actually a quotation, perhaps an anachronistic quotation, from another famous military figure. This is taken from remarks reportedly, supposedly made by the Duke of Wellington in the aftermath of the Waterloo battle in 1815. So almost in our timeline, but perhaps a little after. And here Jack is saying it in anticipation. Then the Duke of Wellington was saying it looking back at the aftermath of the battle. It's popular phraseology with Patrick O'Brien, and it was also popular phraseology in contemporary military history. The same phrase was used by Major General Jeremy Moore to describe retrospectively the British action to retake the Falkland Islands in uh, 1982. So, Mike, j- just how near run is this thing going to be? Well, it is a damn near run thing. They're two cable lengths away, running at eight knots, and there's just no turning back now. He's fully committed. And now the big frigate ports her helm. She's been lured of the surprise the entire way, and she has no chance of weathering the iceberg's windward port. Point. So she intends to hit the surprise as hard as she can and try to cripple her before she's out of reach. And O'Brien writes, he struggled. This is this is Jack. His course was wholly committed now. And again, he eased the helm, his eyes as intent upon the lane of green water as they might have been on a tall hedge with God knows what beyond. And he galloping towards it. So I, I love this horseback metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're hell bent for leather going hard as you can, going to hop over that hedge, but you have no idea what's on the other side here. It's just beautiful writing. You know, Jack is watching the whiter surf rising on the white ice and the still whiter albatross crossing the swell. And and almost, it, to me, sounded kind of like descriptions of heaven or, you know, kind of walking into the light, and wow. which was also a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, a worrying. Little bit worried yeah. about this here, right? And then O'Brien continues, and even before he heard the Americans broadside, he was stunned and deafened by the enormous crash of ice falling from the cliff itself. He felt the ship's hull tremble and then grate on the iceberg's submerged outer shelf. And he saw the mizzen mast shot through in two separate places, sway, break, and go slowly over the side. Wow. Oh, and, you know, I'm thinking to myself, so if this was a U.S. television series, this would be the end, the end of the yeah. season. You know, <laughs> this big cliffhanger awaiting episode one next season. But Jack and Surprise going into the light, everything crashing around him. I'm really grateful that this is not an American cliffhanger here. 
Right. We're, we're only just getting through this chapter here. I, Mike, I, I really enjoy this passage. Like you say, it's really exciting writing. Part of me, though, is thinking this is a bit of a sort of series of O'Brien greatest hits. I don't think he's having to reach very hard to write about icebergs, chases, narrow chases to windward, fog, stern chases. These are things that we've seen before. We've appreciated them before. We appreciate right. them now, the way he's put them together here. But this is stuff that we've seen before in the previous books. As have we seen the bit of seamanship that comes next to put things back to rights. The surprise has lost her mizzenmast. Axes, axes, roars Jack. Cut away, cut clear, cut all clear. Everything, shrouds, backstays, rigging are all whipping free as they run past the ice cliff. The main yard scraping the ice, which again is an echo from episodes in other books like the Treason's Harbour, I think. They enter open water with sea room to spare for three miles. And of course, the American frigate is trapped, unable to get around to windward of this big um, iceberg. The surprise is answering her helm perfectly and is an entirely living ship floating and under control. There's a mass of ice between her and her enemies, and I think we're expected to take this as a signal that we can all breathe easy. Jack goes into seamanship mode. He's trying to fix what's happened. He's trying to make ready to figure out what he can do to replace the mizzen mast. He's really delighted, though, that the ship is swimming in clear water, only two inches in the well, and no damage to the people. No no casualties, at least no serious ones. The ice missed us by a shaver, reports Wilkins. And Tom Pullings, who's often the, the chorus figure when it comes to dangers at sea, comes back smiling, curiously talkative, says, at one moment I did not think she could do it. My heart was fairly in my mouth. And then when the ice came down, I said, all up with you, Pullings, old cock. But however, it missed. And as they go on talking about it, Jack is asking if Tom had seen what happened. And Tom says he's really not sure. He saw the American opening up with deliberate shots, hitting the mizzen. He was aware of the surprise getting around the point, about to run clear, that this these rounds had come in either hitting the iceberg or some other way the concussion from these rounds may be causing this great big thousand-ton steeple of ice to come crashing down, plunging into the surprise's wake, soaking but not hurting everybody with odd fragments spoiling little little areas like the gingerbread work on the taffrail. And Jack realizes that he too has been soaked. Now, this is a, a problem from the point of view of setting the ship to right here, Mike, because they're without a mizzenmast, and sooner or later that's going to be a problem for them. Trying to save it, that is to say, trying to save the mizzen, mizzenmast rather than cutting it all and letting it go, would have put them still in danger of being pushed right back onto the ice. So he says, Tom, let's put before the wind. Let's sail about dead down wind put our oldest whalers men into the crow's nest to pick off a way, pick a safe pathway through the ice. They do this time take the time to ship a bow grace, a fender at the front of the boat. They light the galley fires and get everyone fed since it's going to be a long time before, if at all, this American frigate can find a way to make ground to catch them up. And Pullings expresses the hope, Mike, that maybe this American captain's got a strong sense of duty and will protect the convoy. And let, let us hope, says Jack, that he has a very strong and overwhelming sense of duty. And Mike, th this again could almost be the end of the chapter. Like we're sailing away from the American frigate. We're knotting and splicing a little bit. We've got some mast mending to do, but ice between us and evil, all is well, right? Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing as I'm listening to Patrick talk, thinking I'm waiting for him to say the end. But I guess O'Brien isn't quite finished yet. No. Nah. Well, well into the afternoon, the American rounds the point. The brig, as it turns out, had lost her yard, was shot through the slings, and had stopped a nine-pound cannonball under the water lines, you know, springing a butt. So there were waters and uh, pieces of ice pouring into her. So the brig had been delayed, the frigate had been delayed, and the surprise is now 10 miles ahead of the frigate, and the surprise is past a lot of the icebergs and the fields of ice that the American is going to have to make her way through all these ice channels and islands. And now with all this time, O'Brien writes, Jack sat down to his belated dinner with as easy a mind as was compatible with the loss of a mass, the presence of an active and enterprising enemy, and of an unconscionable amount of ice ahead in the form of floating islands or massive flows. So... We've got this pause 
But O'Brien's reminding us there's still a lot of danger around here. Yeah, and who better to inquire on the reader's behalf about the real danger than our good friend Stephen Maturin. So he gets into it a little bit with Jack. He says, surely the loss of one of our three masts is going to slow us down by a third. And then we get this nice little bit of uh, explanation of the physics of downwind sailing by Jack, who says, well, when we're sailing large, meaning when we're sailing downwind, the mizzen makes little difference. If, on the other hand, we face a side wind, the balance is going to be upset and speed will fall off sadly. Jack's therefore hoping that the wind will remain in their favour until he hopes some lingering notion of responsibility makes the captain of that frigate turn back to his convoy. Stephen doesn't think it was his convoy. And as, as Stephen is saying this, Mike, I'm not sure where Stephen gets his his intuition from, but never mind. He's kind of being the conversation partner here for Jack. He says maybe it wasn't actually his convoy. Maybe they just had a chance meeting, perhaps back in the river plate. He is convinced, though, that they will turn back and protect them now. Stephen sees how Jack is sadly done up, really worn out here, and observes as well that Jack's appetite is failing. Tells him to drink his wine, offers to mix him what he calls a comfortable dose, and send him to bed. But back again to this idea of we're managing Stephen and Jack both being not quite you know, with the world and in good shape here, and they're solicitors of each other's well-being. Jack says, no, nah, I'm not going to go to bed. I'm not taking any kind of a dose. I'm not going to give this bloody-minded cove any opportunity to creep on us during the night. Coffee, he says, is more the mark than a dose, however comfortable and kindly intended. And this this comes before Jack does what Jack always does in tricky situations, which is to dig into the meat and feed himself and sustain himself with yeah, mutton chops. He, he, unlike Eduardo, is, is very fond of the sheep. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Jack is up in the crow's nest all night. He's sustained by these mutton chops, and he's sustained by the coffee that Killick or his mate continuously climb aloft and bring them in this tin you know, with a strap that they carry in their teeth. The watch on deck is continuing to fend off slabs of ice with what few spars they have remaining on the ship. And the whalers up in the crow's nest are constantly advising Jack and the crew which lanes to take, which ones to avoid. And despite all their hard work, they still get some pretty wicked strokes from this deep swimming ice. Yeah. And the text says, and several times the high perched Jack Aubrey trembled for his nest, literally trembled with extreme cold, weariness, and the grave tension of guiding his ship through this potentially mortal maze. He was no longer a young man. And then it continues, <laughs> by the strange sunrise, he was older still. And boy, I you know, we, we talk about Jack and Jack thinking about his age and everything, but this is the first time I kind of remember O'Brien really just sort of telling us flat out, this is not Jack's impressions or Stephen's impression. Here, here we are. This is Jack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's really happening. Jack, Jack is definitely, objectively, yeah. not the man he was. Uh, and he's feeling it, and we get to notice it as well. Wow. O'Brien gives us beautiful descriptions, as he often does at these kind of moments, of the visuals, of the sea and the ice and the sky. He shares with us the point of view of Jack looking back at the American frigate seven miles behind them. Her hull is looking black in the light. And it's interesting to contrast with all the white of the iceberg and the foam and the albatross that we had earlier on. I'm sure this is all right. on purpose from O'Brien here. Jack swings over the side of the crow's nest and we get another sign that Jack is not his capable self. Gripping the topmost shrouds, his frozen hands slip on the ice coating and the text says he would have fallen, but that his legs so long at sea instantly whipped around a shroud below and held him for the vital moment. I might, there's a lot of extra short-term jeopardy being piled on here, don't you think? There really is. I mean, you know, we just had this back in Chapter 9, and, you know, you and I were saying last week, it seems like, whoa, there was all this signs of short-term jeopardy near at hand. Then Chapter 10 opened, and it was so uh, all is well. And here we're coming back to it, one after another after another. Yeah. For some reason, O'Brien wants to ratchet up our expectations that, you know, that the story needs to continue. I, mean, I guess right. that must have something to do with the fact that we're getting to the end of chapter 10 here. Well, on deck, Jack has Tom send the hands to breakfast 
and ask that they start to pack on sail as soon as they get back. The American is already wearing studding sails on both sides, aloft and alow. And Tom says, well, he must have a pretty clear stretch of water, but you know, he notes that the ice down there looks pretty solid. And I, and I think mm. Tom's being a little hopeful here. here. And as he's speaking, the surprise hits another heavy flow of ice and Jack and Tom both stagger. So you know, constant reminders of, of yeah. this peril here. And everybody's in danger. The way that we sublimate danger aboard the surprise is we go and eat a meal. So what happens next is there's a big breakfast. And Jack is speaking very little, but he tells Stephen about the wildlife that he's seen, an albatross, some seals, a whale. And Stephen starts to, to talk to Jack then about the changes in color that he's noticed in icebergs, a very typical abstract philosophical topic for Stephen to, to drift off on here. He's seen all of these changes at the point of cleavage where icebergs have dropped, uh, dropped apart. And as he's carrying on with this, he notices that Jack's head is sinking down onto his breast. I'm guessing then that Stephen is about to tiptoe away and leave Jack to have a snooze here. But no, Midshipman Reed bursts in, says, Captain Pulling says, would you like to step on deck? And Jack heaves his 17 stone up. We're given another little marker that he's not the nimble young fox that he once was. And up on deck, Reed gives him a telescope, pointing him to windward. With a great smile, Jack stamps his foot on the frozen deck and says, ha ha, he counted his chickens without his host. My God, ha 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 ha. And Mike, th th this is a, a nice little Aubreyism here. We had the same combination back in the Nutmeg of Constellation, but at that time, that was from Stephen's lips. He counts chickens without recognizing his host. This is a combination of the familiar to count one's chickens before they're hatched and to reckon without one's host. And again, I don't know if this is a Brian teasing us with a little look back or if he's just kind of reached for an Aubreyism that was handy in the notes pages of one of his books here. Anyhow, they're all very delighted. These Aubreyisms are flying. The frigate is motionless, the American frigate, that is. And we can see that her boats are getting over the side. The lookout says she's gone down a blind alley in the ice field. She's had to come to a full stop. They're going to have to tow her back three miles into the wind. And we have this nice little moment of lower deck banter here. The lookout tells his mate, oh, won't he cop it? The poor bleeding sod of a lookout of theirs. <laughs> so I think that's what you call schadenfreude, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, the American fires a gun to lured. And of course, Reed standing right next to the captain says, the enemy has fired a, a lured gun, sir, if you please. <laughs> Jack, you know, at least he's in good enough service. He says, you astonish me, Mr. Reed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad he's not too tired for a bit of wit here. And then a signal breaks out and Reed uh, reads it off. Alphabetic, sir, or alphabet. And I, I love that <laughs> between the Americans and the or alphabet. Yeah, we, we borrowed that, but I guess the flags, uh, you know, on the ship's a bit different. And it says H-A-P-P-Y-R-E-T-U-R-N. Happy return, sir. And Jack finds that most handsome. And he Considers responding compliments to Mr. Washington, having consulted pullings on who, who's their president now. <laughs> but he decides that's way too long and just replies, same to you, and gives the American a gun in return. Ah, it's, it's a nice little echo of the feeling that Jack has had ever since he quit Boston, that he has a, this kind of esteem for American sailors, and he likes to see the esteem return. And he's very, very willing to go along with a little greeting here couple of things interestingly of course it would have been president madison not president washington i'm guessing that's a little deliberate joke on o'brien's part highlighting either that jack and tom pullings have been around the world so many times now and they don't know what year it is still less do they know and remember who's the president of america or m maybe he's just joking that they're not that well informed and up to date on american politics who knows there's also an interesting little sidebar about the signaling here and about how an alphabetical signal takes up a lot of flags it has to be spelt out one flag for each letter and maybe this is helping us to remember the episode of nelson's famous signal at the battle of trafalgar nelson wanted to make a signal to the fleet as battle was approaching that began with the phrase england confides but the signal officer pointed out to him that confides is not in the signal book it would have to be spelt alphabetically just as we've seen here 
and that would take a lot of signal halyard space and a lot of signaling bandwidth amongst all the ships reading the signal and repeating it. So they went for a different word. They chose the word expects, for which there's a code hoist of only three flags, and hence the signal was edited to become the very, very famous signal that everybody remembers at Trafalgar. England expects that every man will do his duty. So, yeah, what's good for Nelson is good for Aubrey. Nice. So, turning to Tom, Jack says, Tom, let us not crack on at all, but proceed east-northeast at a walking pace until we are out of this infernal ice. Let us not rush upon our doom like a parcel of mad lunatics or gabardine swine. A walking pace, Captain Pullings. And in the afternoon, we will start work on a jury mast. And Mike, if I say that with a nice downward inflection, again, it sounds like the end of the chapter. That could be the, the end. Finishing on a little Aubreyism here. But no, it's not the end. Help us dig into this Aubreyism. Gabardine swine. That sounds like it's going to be a wrong one somewhere. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is. You know, and I thought, well, maybe O'Brien didn't want to end the book here because he didn't want us to miss this, this biblical reference dad joke mashup here. Let us not <laughs> rush upon our doom like a parcel of mad lunatics or gabardine swine. So in, in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, there's this story and it's slightly different in each gospel. So I'm just going to kind of synthesize it together in Gadarene, not Gabardine, this region, there's a demon-possessed man, and, and the townsfolks can't handle him. He, he breaks free of their chains. He lives among the tombs, howling and hurting himself, and they're worried. And, and so they, you know, they tell Jesus about this. Jesus is coming from afar, and a demon inside the man calls out, Jesus, the son of the Most High God, you know, what do you have to do to me? And, and begs him not to torment him. And this after Jesus has told the unclean spirit to come out. And Jesus asks the spirit's name and it replies, my name is Legion for we are many. Ooh. And you know, he, the spirit, or they, the spirit, they beg not to be sent away from this region, ask to just be released. Jesus releases them and they enter this great herd of swine grazing on the hillside. The now possessed swine you know, about 2,000 of them run down the steep bank into the sea and drown themselves. And so this is where we get this adjective, gadarene, meaning involving or engaged in a headlong or potentially disastrous rush to do something, like mm. the gadarene rush to war in 1914, right? It's also the origin of the line, we are legion. And you know, oh. there are many books and short stories entitled, We Are Legion. It's featured in Stephen King novels and films, books that you know scare the pants off of me, like The Exorcist, shows like The Red Dwarf over in the UK, Angel, the spinoff from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, even Honey, I Shrunk the Kids television show, and you know more video games and heavy metal songs that I care to count. Not to mention a famous Daniel Defoe speech to the British House of Commons in 1701 called Legion's Memorial. So huh. you know, a real heavy-duty reference, also a big part of the theory of scapegoating. You know, it's, it's kind of used to come oh, up yeah. with that. So a really nice um, reference here. And just a classic, can't help but chuckle Aubreyism here. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, I think there are lots of references for us all to follow up. If you're of an age to prefer Daniel Defoe, then why don't you go and reach for Robinson Crusoe? If you're more of a Red Dwarf kid or a Buffy the Vampire Slayer kid, then I'm sure you can get that, hit that up on Netflix. Go and grab yourselves a quick cultural reference while Mike and I do the same. And we'll be right back after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole well it's after dinner now and jack and tom and mr bentley the carpenter are conferring about the jury mizzen mast that they have to put up here and they realize just how grievous their recent loss of spars is the spare spars that would otherwise have been stored on deck have all been washed or blown away. They've got treasure, they've got prizes galore, but scarcely a stick to call their own, to use their words. Playing music later on with Stephen, Jack explains how they had finally raised stump enough and gaff enough to spread a tolerable mizzen, good enough to sail at a moderate pace, 
without straining the rudder right off its pintles. And helpfully for us here, as a little bit of uh, expository foreshadowing, Stephen says, explain to me, Jack, about pintles. And Jack gives a little description of the mechanism by which the rudder is attached to the stern of the ship. After they finish their music, Jack says, Lord Stephen, when you remember how hot we were after those China ships so short a while ago and how simple we should have looked if we had taken them with that devilish great 18-pounder frigate and the brig coming down on us with the weather gauge and when you consider how happy we are now to have come off with the loss of no more than our mizzen, why? It makes you think. And Stephen replies with his great put-down, I do not know that I should go quite so far as that. (laughs) <laughs> this is great Steve, Stephen says well this is all very well you can be as satirical as you like but I Jack think that it's all come out uncommon well and he goes on to say he didn't think they'd be sleeping in peace at all that night and Mike there's there's, there's all kinds of hostages to fortune in this smug complacent happy intervention here from Jack right yeah yeah you know oh oh I didn't think we'd be sleeping in peace tonight wait wait somebody grab a blade pin I hear this bum 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 Jaws soundtrack in the background going, Oh, sleeping peacefully tonight? Do you think so here? But <laughs> oh, right, so they, they do sleep in profound peace. And Wilkins, who's being relieved by Granger, notes that Granger may have what he calls something of a ducking in an hour or so. And they're both looking at these low, dark clouds in the northeast. And Granger says a little bit of rain in this precious cold will certainly wake him up. And Wilkins asks if it's uncommon to see lightning in these latitudes. And Granger says, no, no you, know, you, you see it pretty often. It, perhaps it seems uncommon because, you know, when we're down here, we don't spend any more time on deck than we have to. And as the watch goes on, uh, it starts to snow. The winds grow variable, uh, almost taking the ship aback at one point. And all of a sudden, the weather turns into violent rain mixed with sleet. And at half past three in the morning, according to Stephen's watch, Stephen wakes to an enormous combination of noises and realizes the ship has been struck by lightning. Ah, uh, there you go. Jack Aubrey, that's for you, not grasping a belaying pin. Honestly. Ah. Especially not grasping a belaying pin in the last three pages of the last chapter of a book. How can he be so stupid, honestly? <laughs> well, the mainmast is completely shattered by this lightning bolt. So we we had already only a jury-rigged mizzenmast. Now the mainmast has gone completely. The foremast is quite untouched. We've got yards lying athwart ships. The ship, nonetheless, has to put before the wind, regardless of what the helmsman can do. And Stephen is called to the sick berth. There are three casualties there. There's a nipper dolling named Isaac Rame, apparently uninjured but with a black mark the size of a shilling over his heart and no good signs really about the state of his heart after this lightning strike that he's had. Stephen and Fabian and Padin take the rest of the night treating the strange burn wounds on the backs of the two other foremast hands. And I think there's there's more to account for here than just these strange injuries to these three men here. At breakfast, Jack explains just how bad things are. This is a pretty go, he says. We are in a pretty mess. But strangely to Stephen's ears, he's sounding pretty cheerful, as if the loss of the mainmast was of only slight importance. He says that after breakfast, he's going to show Stephen something far more extraordinary than the mainmast. Our rudder, he says, has gone by the board. Oh, oh, cried Stephen, aghast. Are we rudderless so? I will not deceive you, brother. We are without a rudder, (laughs) which is, you know, (laughs) primo Jack Aubrey banter here serving Stephen out with a bit of his own sarcastic kind of rejoinders here. The problem has been that the pintles had been lifted off the dumb shoulder and the braces by some of the earlier ice flow collisions, and the, the rudder had been hanging on by the tiller alone until the lightning strike, which struck the rudder head, shattered it all the way down to the water line. The rudder dropped clean away. They are rudderless. And again, Mike, you know, echoes of Desolation Island and right. damage in the South Seas here. This was not a good time. And Stephen's wondering then why Jack is so apparently easygoing and almost flippant. Can't anything be done, asks Stephen. Well, I'm sure we'll find something, replies Jack and says, meanwhile, pass me the marmalade, not quite as good as Sophie's, but still pretty good. This seems to Stephen like no time to be toying with marmalade here. Right. Well, O'Brien writes, Stephen had often heard Jack say when life at sea grew more trying than the human frame could bear that it was no use whining. 
but he had never seen quite this degree of insouciance, this casual lack of concern, or what he felt tempted to call irresponsible levity. Ooh. Yeah. So, you know, Stephen's really doubting a little bit. What's going on here? What is, is Jack really had a grip on this thing? And he wonders how much of this is assumed as part of the captain's duty in a virtually hopeless situation. How much of it is just sort of Jack's natural reaction here? And Stephen really wonders how hopeless is this situation really? Because even with his limited knowledge of the sea, he knows that a ship this far from land with only one mass and no rudder is in a very sad way. And, you know, they could only sail directly before the wind. And in these latitudes, the wind is always westerly with yep. no land then until they come all the way around the globe and, and are back to Chile again, essentially. Yeah, and this sounds like a recipe for storms and high seas and right. more damage. This sounds like the leopard all over again. Stephen doesn't want to test this out by asking anyone directly, but he sounds out a few of his shipmates quietly, and they all agree with him that actually, yeah, th this could be a grave situation. Even so, he's detected this general cheerfulness, and even even Killick is quite lighthearted, and he's asking himself, have I been plying the ocean with a partial of Stoics all this time? Or, in my ignorance, am I myself somewhat over-timid? And he's reflecting on this, and he thinks, well, maybe his encounters with the foremast jacks are showing him a different moral aspect to the situation, a different view of what cause and effect and restitution really looks like here. He thinks that the lower deck knows that Vidal and his closest nipper dolling mates had smuggled Mr. Dutour ashore, that Dutour had in some way informed on Stephen, putting his life in danger, and that this piece of aiding and abetting of treachery had brought bad luck on the ship, even if Vidal had meant his intervention in a, in a good way. Bad luck, then, could be taken to mean a curse, a spell, or a divine resentment of impiety, which is clearly something that sailors care about, even if they can't define it in quite those words. Right. After all, they'd missed the three China ships. They had nearly been sunk by the Americans, nearly been sunk by the Ice Islands. Now we've been struck with lightning. These are all clearly markers of bad luck, as far as the sailors are concerned. But, says the text, it was a nipper dolling that had copped it. And once he went over the side, with the bad luck would be off the ship. And, Mike, this, this is pretty grim foretelling for poor old Isaac Rame, the one with the black mark above his heart. But indeed, the next day, when Isaac Rame has passed away and goes over the side without a splash, the text says they went back to their work with a particular satisfaction, one that informed their entire attitude. And I, I, I think probably if you're anybody other than Isaac Rame's nearest and dearest, you're meant to have a smirk on your face at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it, 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 I think O'Brien, you know, sort of pokes that smirk up to an even higher level. You know, he, he tells us that this attitude on board the ship continues for a week. And Stephen writes a paper to Diana about it called Mariners Consensus and Cohesion in Certain States of Adversity. Mm -hmm. And he tucks that paper in with another on some remarks on Peruvian serapedes for the Royal Society. So, you know, I, I love this kind of juxtaposition of, of this social psychological treatise about cohesion of sailors, along with remarks about barnacles. And, and who's closer than barnacles, after all? You know? Exactly. Yeah, great cohesion they are here. So the weather is better. The temperatures are staying above freezing during the day. And they hang a steering oar over the quarter that provides just a point or two of northerly deviation here. So they can make a little bit of way northward. There's three sad little poles standing where the stately mast used to be. And the foremast, top mast, and top gallon are worked into the launch's mast and standing for the shattered main mast. And wow. there's an even stranger assembly replacing the mizzen, a fore and aft sail the size of the cabin's tablecloth is, is up there. So this, is, this has got to be quite a sight here. It has. And, you know, it's literally made out of broom handles and, and hope here. Right. But still, you know, we're not getting any sign of worry about the physical safety of the ship. We're getting a sign of pride and resourcefulness that we're able to get on and get about it here. And the, the, the only tricky moment comes when Stephen misjudges his moment, I think, to comment on the uh, the seamanship being displayed here, looking at the very broad but very shallow square sails hanging so low from the main and foreyards, Stephen asks whether they should be hoisted, and 
The text says that voices of strong displeasure told him they were hoisted. <laughs> and Stephen continued going forward past all the staysails, past all these sails that are up, the, the, the most that could possibly be managed. Ah, he says, it is like Bridie Coleman's washing day, I do declare. Again, another unfortunate attempt to please. Everything is within easy hand's reach, so it is. <laughs> and, you know, comparing the work of Royal Navy seamen to a washing line isn't actually calculated to earn him much goodwill. Now, Mike, I don't think we've got much to say about Bridie Coleman, or have we? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I think you, know, you and I both worked hard on this. The Patrick O'Brien Muster book worked hard on this. Yeah. And the Muster book sort of gave up altogether, had no idea about Bridie Coleman. Although, as, as we're looking, we did find this English poet, Anna Letitia Barbold, whose poem Washing Day in 1797, it's something, you know, her life and her poem is something that O'Brien would, would certainly love. So I have no idea whether this is part of the reference here, but it's it's kind of the the women coming together on washing day and and kind of displacing this patriarchal society of men in the household there. They've kind of taken over like soldiers taking the field and yeah. the husband's walk through his garden is disrupted by the flapping laundry in his face when he calls for food. You know, he's kind of ignored because, hey, it's washing day. So this absence of patriarchal authority in the home uh, also, this woman who, great English writer, one of the early kind of ones that weaving feminists kind of in the, in the face of a muse, jokingly, in her writings and poetry, could be that, but I can't really lock them in. I could just say that O'Brien yeah. certainly would know of her, would have liked this, but you actually found a connection, perhaps. Well, I, I don't know. I think it's at least as tenuous as any other. There's an online collection of folklore tales compiled by school children in Ireland in the 1930s. It's all been catalogued and published. It's online. And there's a folk tale involving a presumably fictitious woman by the name of Bridie Coleman, who has various escapades involving a tramp and a goat and a boy around the house, uh, but nothing to do with laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Everything to do with murder and burial, but I'll, I'll let you go look up the story if you want to. But anyway, and, and who knows? There, there must have been something that caused O'Brien to land on the name Bridie Coleman. So um, um, maybe we've found a little corner of, of part of it here. Well, and we do know that Bridie is a form of Bridget. So there's That's a call true. back to Stephen at home as well. So I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Who knows indeed. Well, at dinner, at Sunday dinner, Stephen observes to himself, this is an extraordinarily small piece of plum duff. And he, he goes on speculating about whether he's being got at for his rude remarks about laundry. I wish it may not be an ignoble stroke of revenge for my innocent words this morning about her harmless, meek and barge-like appearance, innocent upon my word, and even, I thought, amusing, a mild pleasantry. But not at all. Prim faces, wry looks, and now this meagre, despicable pudding? I had thought better of my shipmates. And I, I don't know whether he's being serious about this or whether he's just kind of joshing, but anyhow, Jack says... He's, he's not right with his facts. You're mistaken, he says. Jack and Mr. Adams the Purser have inventoried all the stores, the ship's, as it were, public stores and the officer's individual private stores, and we've, they've divided them to set up rations for the rest of the journey, which could include following this westerly going dead downwind all the way to the Cape of Good Hope. And he explains, that piece of pudding is your full ration, my dear Stephen. And he explains that he's already shared this news with the ship's company, unless and until they can fashion and ship a rudder. That, and he's basically about to say, this is all we can have. Stephen interrupts and says, well, it's worse. I can't answer for your life if you spend another two minutes in the frigid water working on the rudder. And I, he's kind of reporting retrospectively what Jack seems to have been up to in the previous few hours. Last time, he says, it was nip and tuck with hot blanket, fomentations, and half a pint of my best brandy. Jack goes on then, talking about the measures that he's taking. Unless they have a rudder, he says, he intends to steer for the Cape, edging north as far as he can the entire way. Which again, Mike, is very, very similar to the situation the leopard was in leading up to their encounter at Desolation Island. I... Even though he says they're sailing 100 miles a day, he's allowed for just 50 miles a day, meaning that it will take them 70 days 
to travel the three and a half thousand miles. So, he says, that succulent, luxurious pudding now in front of you is the 70th part of all the duff that you will eat before we raise the table mountain. And Stephen has what I think is a straightforward, honest response. God love you, Jack. What things you tell me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Wait, it, it's interesting. Jack reminds Stephen that Bly sailed 4,000 miles with less than a thousandth part of the surprise's stores. And then he says, I love this line. He says, you will never despond, Stephen, said Jack with a very slight emphasis. Mm. And I am sure you will never find any of the seamen do either. And, and I thought to myself, is this Jack recalling Stephen to his duty as an officer? You know, yeah, you've, you know hey, so. you've got to keep up a good front here. Is this Jack also just trying to reassure his friend? Mm. And is this Jack also knowing that Stephen has kind of a special relationship with the crew, those four mass Jacks, and wanting to make sure their journey is a success? So we can't have Stephen kind of running around here all doom and gloom. And, and Stephen gets it, agrees that he certainly will not despond. And then Stephen mentally says, you know, okay, so I, I got to put away all these thoughts of these latitudes, you know, all my thoughts about the frequent storms, about the danger of being pooped or broached to, of being lost with all hands in the foam. <laughs> so he's thinking, okay, I can't think, can't think about a pink elephant anymore here. <laughs> and then Jack says, you know, he's kind of like, well, while we're on the subject, Jack asks Stephen not to be facetious when talking about the ship. And he reminds him how sensitive the people are about her appearance. And he suggests that Stephen limits his comments, you know, if he's going to make any at all, to saying, oh, or superb, or I have never seen anything better, and not to include anything particular in his comments from here on out about the ship. <laughs> I, I, I like this a lot. I re, like you say, Mike, there's this lovely little touch of ambiguity and light and shade in the way Stephen and Jack are talking to each other. Makes me feel good reading about it. Makes me feel good as well reading the humor of Killick's report to the lower deck of what's happened here. Killick tells his mate Art Grimble, the doctor was choked off for being a satyr. And of course, Killick's got the wrong idea. He's got a bit of a, an Aubreyism of his own here. A, a satyr is not the, the Greek mythical beast that it really is. He thinks that means somebody who has been speaking sarcastically. But the crew's also been thinking about Stephen's onshore behavior, meaning satyr in the sense of you know, a bit, a bit of a play with the ladies. Anyhow, the word spreads that Stephen's been choked off and almost struck down on deck and because of his careless words to Jack. And the word spreads then that Stephen's plum duff had been taken away in from him and eaten before his eyes. And the crew in return is very kind and conciliatory towards the doctor for quite a while afterwards. And their goodwill really warms Stephen's spirit. And it turns out that the spirit did need warming He's still got these tough cases in the sick berth, these terrible burns, a vile moth he has discovered eating through his collections, and he can't find any black pepper in the ship's rations to stop it. And he comes on deck to grey faces. And Mike, we've had white and we've had black and now we've got grey. All, all this monochrome tonality here reinforcing all the kind of gloom and unworldliness. Grey faces, it says, among the men and on the quarter deck. Read points to windward at a topsail schooner and a larger ship some miles beyond her saying oh it's the brutal great american come to snap us up people are upset particularly after the handsome message that they'd had from the american and they were thinking better of him at this point reed says well the captain's aloft but he can't see too well today his eyes are watering in the cold and again mike we get this hark back to jack aubrey not being 100 percent okay and i'm feeling pretty gloomy and despondent at this point, just like the ship's crew are. Yeah, yeah. Well, Stephen, you know, pulls out his own telescope, this is superlative telescope, he said, made for him by Dolan, and it's got higher magnification than the typical Navy telescopes. You know, it's made so that Stephen can identify birds. So he's not looking at, you know, trying to identify big ships. He's trying to see a little bird out there in the distance. And Stephen says to Reed, well, now frigates, they have just one row of gun ports, right? And and I love it, you know, <laughs> treating, treating Stephen like he knows nothing says, yes, sir, just one, said Reed patiently, holding up a single finger. Well, says Stephen, <laughs> this boat or vessel has two as well as some at each end. And Reed is like, what? Well, wait, wait, you know, can I borrow your glass? And he holds it. 
and uh, Reed hollers to Pulleys that it's not the great Yankee, but a two-decker, a 64-gun ship. And just after Reed has told Pulleys, they hear Jack's voice booming down. She's a 64-gun ship, the old Bernice, I think. Yes, the old Bernice from the New South Wales station. And that's B E R E. N I C E. And Jack <laughs> has to turn this into a little a Jack play on words. Very nicey, very nicey, too, he adds with a private chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a little, oh, this could be good news here. And then, Ian, we've had a reference to Dolan before, I think. Yeah, right? I, I, yeah and Dolan, a, a very well chosen name for a telescope maker. John Dolan, Fellow of the Royal Society, was an English optician, very famous for his optics business. An optics business that still exists. It, part of his name is on the uh, the British High Street. Dolan and Aitchison Opticians uh, have got the, the name inherited from him. Um, he had patented and commercialized achromatic doublets. And an achromatic doublet is still the same lens configuration that you get in a kind of cheap, ordinary, run-of-the-mill refracting telescope today. In 1761, Dolan had been appointed as optician to the king. Dolan telescopes are said to have sailed with Captain Cook, on his voyage to observe the transit of Venus and to have been used by Lord Nelson, used by others, including King George IV. We've encountered Dolan's telescopes before, I think back in the far side of the world, and we're going to hear of them again, I think, in the future of the canon. So not, not only is it great that this beautifully made telescope is revealing in Stephen's eyes the two rows of gunport and therefore the identity of this ship as the Berenice, which indirectly revealing to us just which character is waiting for us over across the sea here. Stephen tells Reed that the closing ship, this smaller ship, is a schooner and carries very few guns. Mr. Adams embellishes this detail and says, well, she's a Baltimore clipper. She's a schooner in rigging terms, but a clipper in terms of the design of her hull. Oh, says Stephen, she has a hull as well, has she? I was not aware. And again, we can't tell whether this is banter or serious. Never mind. He asks Mr. Adams, meanwhile, if he could possibly find a small bag of pepper from the captain's stores, because Stephen doesn't really want to pay much attention to the significance of this schooner clipper vessel and the Berenice on the horizon. He's thinking, I still need the pepper as a moth repellent. And Adams says, well, I've already looked in spite of that wicked killick. But he stops to note that this schooner coming up close is rounding two. And now, Mike, we get to find out what's going on with the schooner. The schooner, commanded by a midshipman, asks what ship they are, adding in an undertone that maybe this poor hulk can hardly be called a ship. And Pullings responds, His Majesty's hired vessel, surprise, Captain Pullings. And the midshipman clearly doesn't know the captain's list well enough to take account of Captain Pullings' name and tells him, Come aboard with your papers. And as the schooner's hands are all grinning and making fun of the rather dishevelled state of the surprise, when Jack roars out, take that American contraption back to the Berenice and tell Captain Dundas with Captain Aubrey's compliments that he will wait upon him. And I, I love that it shakes the midshipmen up and he scurries away, stops the hands with their antic gestures on the schooner. Uh, but he does have the presence of mind to repeat the order back so he's got it clear and very politely, very kindly reminds Captain Aubrey or tells Captain Aubrey that Philip Aubrey is aboard the Berenice. So now we know what the connection is. It's none other than Hennage Dundas, who's in command of the Berenice. What what nicer cove, Mike, could you wish for to heave upon the horizon when you're in this state that we're in here? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and we're delighted about that. Everybody on the surprise is delighted. And the surprises are also delighted by the fact that now the ship's relative status and hierarchy has changed. It doesn't matter what their sails look like. They've got the senior uh, post captain aboard here. And, uh, you know, several of the surprises leap into the rigging and slap their butts at the schooner as the schooner sails quickly back to the Berenice here in Texas. But more, many more of the hands gathered in the waist or on the forecastle, oblivious of the cold reveling in their prize money preserved, even as it were restored, laughing, clapping one another on the back. Again, <laughs> it could be, a, I, I could just hear Patrick Tull say, the end, but <laughs> he doesn't. But there now, it's like, you know, we had everything. We we're about to have nothing. Oh my gosh, we're back in the game again. Oh, 
It's fantastic. So as the ships draw near, Jack tells Stephen he knows exactly what Dundas is going to say. He says, you know, he's going to say, well, Jack, whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth. And, you know, all his people are going to cackle. And then they see Jack's younger half-brother, Philip, as they're getting closer. And, and Jack remarks on how he's grown. And Captain Dundas sends his barge to the surprise to pick up Jack and Stephen and Tom. He realizes that the surprise really can't get a boat over the side right now. And, and just as predicted, he calls out to Jack, Well, Jack, whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth. Ha, ha, ha. You must be a prime favorite up above heavens. You are in a horrid state. And and Hennage's Bible verse is absolutely right on point. It's Hebrews 12, 6 in the King James Version, which is actually Hebrews quoting Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 here. Huh. And, and, and basically, the you know, and, and people have kind of struggled with this a little bit. It's, you know, why do bad things happen to good people and everything? And and it's kind of saying that God disciplines us to teach us just as a loving father disciplines their son. So, you know, (laughs) if if God is disciplining you, then he loves you as a son. And then some people go on to say, and if you survive it, that that means (laughs) you, you did okay and you're loved here. But Stephen, however, is not worrying about any of this. He's calling over saying, Captain Dundas, can you help me with a few pounds of fresh black pepper? But he can't hear the answer because as soon as he asks the question, you know, surprises start piping Jack over the side down aboard, you know, the barge from the Berenice. Wow. Again, this is all nicely cantering downhill towards a happy close. Stephen might be about to get his half a stone of black pepper. There's a dinner, of course. And after the dinner, Stephen and Tom Pullings walk out as Jack tells Hennage what a pleasant fellow he's made of Philip. And, and I really like this little echo. I, I was totally not expecting to see or hear very much about Philip Aubrey, but in a book where we've heard so much about the, the growing stature of Sam Panda, it's a really nice thing for the, for the Jack followers among us to think, ah, Philip, the half-brother, he's doing okay as well. Hennage says Philip was pretty much born to the sea, will be rated a master's mate in the Hyperion next year, and Jack is very delighted with this idea, and they're drinking port together as Dundas dismisses the servants and observes that, as far as he can tell, Jack and Stephen have had a rough time of it. Jack says, yes, it has been rough. There's been little news from home, and he gets the little fill-in here from Hennage Dundas that they visited Ashgrove last July, Sophie looking splendid, The mother, Mrs. Williams, is with her. The girls are pretty and modest. He says, well, fairly modest and and kind, which is nice. He hadn't seen Diana. And the the canter downhill towards the end, Mike, is pulled up at least least half short here because all isn't quite according to expectation here. He says he had not seen Diana. He heard that she was in Ireland. And maybe that means at home with Bridget or maybe that means not at home with Bridget. Uh, her horses were doing famously, and he had seen poor young Oakes's widow, Clarissa. And Mike, uh, yeah, out of the blue, Clarissa Oakes is a widow. And right. we have to wonder what that means for the story and for the little society of friends, shorebound friends, you know, between Sophie and Diana and the rest of them. And I'm, I'm also still, as I say, thinking here about Bridget. So... Hennage in return asks how the trip had gone for Jack and Stephen. And he says his brother Melville, meaning the first Lord of the Admiralty, had mentioned something confidential. So just tell me what you can, he says. And Jack talks about their success in kicking the French out of the East Indies, wrecking the Diane, taking prizes, destroying a pirate, losing the great wealth that they had just missed out on in these three China ships just a few days before. And that they had been protected by this 38 gun American frigate and the brig. And hearing about the ice and telling about Stephen's enterprise being a failure, he says, I am very much afraid that Stephen was betrayed, that his plan did not come to good, and that it went right to his heart. And Mike, I, I, you know, we're all feeling anxious now for Stephen. How are things at home, and how is he really doing in himself? Well, they drink brandy. They're, they're sort of looking together at the embers in the hanging stove, and they settle, you know, an agreement on what spars that the Bernice can give the surprise. And then they discuss this Baltimore clipper, you know, picked up perfect, it says, but completely empty, not a scrap of paper on her in the South Pacific. Ooh. And, you know, you've been through these many more times than I have. And I thought, why do they keep coming back to this clipper? 
Yeah, well, watch out for this particular schooner, or as you might say, Clipper. She's going to be a new secondary character in her own right in incoming books. So keep an ear open for her in Chapter 1 of the Commodore. So you might even say, stick a pin in the Clipper. Nice. Well, finally, Jack says, no, harking back to this voyage, I think it was a failure upon the whole and a costly failure. But he said, laughing with joy at the thought, I am so happy to be homeward bound. And I am so happy, so very happy to be alive. The end. Oh. No, really. I mean it this time. <laughs> it really is the end. <laughs> very good, Mike. Really interesting close to a really great chapter of a really fascinating book. We should spend a couple of minutes looking back on the book. But before we do that, we also want to look ahead to some other things that are happening in the world of literary fiction. And this week, we're going to spend some time talking with our special guest, the author, Paul Bryars, writer in the name of Seth Hunter of the Nathan Peake novels. So let's take a listen to the chat that you and I had with Paul just a few days ago. Today, we have with us Paul Bryars, a London-based novelist, screenwriter, and filmmaker known also to many of you by the pseudonym, the pen name, Seth Hunter, as the author of the Nathan Peake series of novels set in the Revolutionary and Early Napoleonic Wars. Paul's first Nathan Peake book, Time of Terror, was a Kindle bestseller, and his latest book, the eighth in the series, is Trafalgar, The Fog of War, which was published by MacBooks Press in the U.S. in November 2022 and in the U.K. in January 2023. Paul's written screenplays, documentaries, plays for radio and theater, and children's fiction. Paul, welcome. Hello. <laughs> Good to meet you. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Paul. Welcome to The Lover's Hole. We're going to get into Patrick O'Brien and stuff later on. But to get us started, tell us please a little bit about how you started writing the Nathan Peake novels. Where did the idea come from? Was it always a nautical thing, do you think? Oh, it was never always a nautical thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that, and that would that will get Patrick O'Brien in straight away because um, I don't never I don't I was such a, I'd read all them all you know um, uh, at the time that um, I was approached about this and I would never have thought of uh, taking up nautical fiction after reading him because he was he's the master and it was a strange story in a way I'd made a a, a ninety minute docudrama for Channel Four in in the UK uh, called Nelson's Trafalgar. And um, that was a, a, a factual version of uh, Nelson's life rather than just the Battle of Trafalgar. And at the same right. time, I was writing a novel. Uh, I, I had written a number of novels, mainly published by Bloomsbury in the UK and mm -hmm. Farrah Strauss and Giro in the, in the States, but all contemporary yeah. uh, themes. And um, I just had a, a, a desire to write a history, but it was going to be about um, an American agent based in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars. And my reasons behind mm. that were that I was just interested in the ideals that were zinging around in America at that particular time. And I knew of a factual story I'd basically come across with my research for television about how Thomas Jefferson, when he was Secretary of State, had sent an American agent to see if he could help Thomas Paine, who was his great friend, uh, escape the guillotine. And uh, I, I got very involved in all of that, the factual stuff. And But the book, when, when I, I wrote about six chapters of the novel and an outline, and uh, as a result, I talked to um, finishing editor at uh, Hodder on the advice of my agent about it, and he was very keen for me to turn it into nautical fiction. I had my doubts, as I said, <laughs> um, very severe doubts. But uh, it was the voice that bothered me more than anything, uh, because Patrick O'Brien's voice is so brilliant. Um, it so captures that early 19th century and, and, and late 18th century voice, perhaps more 18th century than 19th. And uh, that, I know mm. that's very important, but but he, he persuaded me. I mean, all authors will be persuaded if somebody says to you, well, actually, basically what he said to me, which might interest you, was that, look, if I can go to my colleagues and say, this is the English passengers meets master and commander, we're away. Nice, nice. 
Oh, I didn't have I didn't have the honesty and the integrity <laughs> to say, oh, come on. I mean, I'm probably anything else. The six chapters I've written, I've researched with a British Arts Council grant in the catacombs under Paris. Wow. You know, the oh whole thing was in Paris. So anyway, mm-hmm. I, I did it. And I have to stay on the upside, having read all the Patrick O'Briens and read most of them twice. This did give me something to live for, you know. Oh, right. wonderful. <laughs> Plus, I guess that you're, you're up to number eight, so something must have gone well enough with the first few that you still you still feel yeah, the buzz, Yeah, right? I mean, there have been there are a lot of head-banging times. Uh, you know, oh. I particularly hate it when I use, um, I use words that weren't around at the particular time. Uh, I think I've done that uh, a few times, and I'm very, very careful. And that makes it a little less fun because you have to be very careful about all the dialogue that nothing comes out that is uh, so anachronistic. I've done a lot of sailing, and in fact, I've uh, I've been involved in three films with square riggers that were of that period. Okay. It's just this great, I shouldn't call it shadow of Patrick O'Brien, but it's there, that thought of what would he say? Oh, mm. that could drive you mad, couldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Paul, tell us, Seth Hunter is an awesome name. When I first saw that, I thought, you know, I'd love to have that name. I, you know, I'd, I'd love, but why Why a pen name? Why that pen name? And, and why for these novels? Well, this was, again, uh, the idea of my commissioning editor, who was, it was then Hodder, who uh, uh, headline um, an imprint of Hachette, who were publishing the um, uh, books. And he, he felt that because I, I was known for writing contemporary thrillers and, and sexual politics, you might say, as Paul Ryers. And I also, as it, as it happened, just had a commission to do three children's books that it would be better to have a different name for the histories. And he had three books in mind, and these were later extended to six before I changed publishing. And um, when he came up with this, uh, on a spare of the moment thing, which I began to regret, but I don't now, I came up with this name, Seth Hunter. Seth was a kind of humorous reference and homage to the followers of Seth in Patrick O'Brien. Uh, you know, do you recall those? Age of surprise. Oh, oh. When, when Aubrey, yeah, uh, when Aubrey is uh, loses his uh, commission, uh, is is set up, is framed, and he becomes a privateer captain in two and a half books. Then his crew, a lot of his crew, are this religious cult called the Followers of Seth. And yeah. so, so I gave the first name Seth, and the Hunter is my mother's maiden name. Nice. Oh. We're right back at the end of the wine dark season, about to start the Commodore. So, you know, we, we've got Sethians all over the place right now. I, I'm delighted to hear that homage. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously well steeped and, and versed in O'Brien. What was the starting point for you? How did you find your way into the books? Wow. Do you know, I, I was just thinking about that the other day because I heard your podcast on Clarissa Oaks. And I think it was that. I think it was that late in mm. that I felt. And then I went back to Master and Commander and, and I read them chronologically. Wow. But I'm pretty sure it was that. And I was a real discovery, you know, the, and, and, and not typical of the rest of the series. And I, and, and, uh, I read mm-hmm. subsequently that it says probably more about the character of uh, Aubrey and Maturin than, than many other books. Or he has time to develop it. There isn't... Um, a very intense plot line right. in Clarissa Oaks, but there's a lot of character. No, yeah, what, what a tremendous place to pick it up. I mean, what a what a yeah. fascinating place to dive in, and and you really get a feel for some of the heart and soul of what makes these books wonderful. Yeah. Now, some people may be diving into your series as well, Paul. You know, so for people who haven't read Nathan Peake yet. You know, and thinking about picking up a copy of Trafalgar, can you give us just a, a little bit, you know, without too many uh, spoilers here, what's the premise of the book? Where's the story going to take us? Yeah, well, um, Trafalgar, I mean, is where the beginning com- of the conversation with my uh, publisher started because uh, of that film, uh, Nelson's yeah. Trafalgar. So it was very, uh, and we had uh, an awful lot of research information and expert. Uh, advice on that uh, from the likes of Colin White and Brian Lavery and many others. Uh, but those two particularly were very involved. And, and Colin, uh, uh, you know, he and I had daily conversations about it. And there was a much bigger story than we showed in the 90 minutes. And many more mysteries and dramas in the lead up to Trafalgar. 
uh, involved, some involving Nelson, some not. And it was that that was on the back of my mind. Now, obviously, uh, when I started the series, again with Patrick O'Brien in my mind, I, I decided to start in 1793, which pre mm -hmm. predates most of the O'Briens. So I was covering the Revolutionary Wars, and there was a lot of naval action there, and I intended to to end it with the end of the Revolutionary Wars, and then was persuaded to carry on, and Trafalgar was an obvious one, and I really went into it, and I let all those things that were in my notes and in my mind at the time come, come out. I mean, one of the most interesting, for me anyway, was the, um, the fact that there had been a, what you might call a Secret Service plot to kidnap Napoleon, which had enraged mm. him so much you know, it's sort of, well, it basically led to the Napoleonic Wars for reasons I won't go into now, but that's historically true because of, of, yeah. of Napoleon's reaction. But one part of his reaction was this incredibly complex plan that was called the Trafalgar Campaign and, and led to the battle where he designed, as he might on a land battle, he designed mm. a form of attack which was to divide the opposition by sending Nelson off in a wild goose chase to the West Indies, thus dividing the British fleet and then sailing up the channel with what he thought would be overwhelming force and escorting the invasion army across to England. That was the plan. And uh, it was fooled, really, or foiled, is that the way to say it, at the Battle of Finisterre, which you may know of which, which yeah. preceded Trafalgar by a couple of months. And as uh, it, I won't go into that now, but it's in the book. And as a result of that, Napoleon gave up his plan. He gave up on the Navy. He thought, I can't, I can't rely on these guys. And, and uh, he, he withdrew his army from the Channel and marched across Europe. So the Trafalgar was a kind of, it didn't have to happen. It was really important that yeah. it did for Britain, for morale as much as anything else. Yeah. But it it wasn't the battle that saved uh, that saved Britain from invasion. That was Finisterre, and as a result, the admiral who won it because he on, only took two Spanish ships was court-martialed oh. <laughs> in typical <laughs> British Navy fashion. Didn't wow. do well enough. Of course, one of the great regrets of us O'Brien readers is that O'Brien never took his character to Trafalgar. He skipped from eighteen oh two to eighteen ten or whatever it was. Tell us a little bit then about how close we might get to the perspective of first-person presence at the Battle of Trafalgar. How much of the battle are we going to see? Well, a fair bit. It's, it basically, I, I knew about this problem before yeah. I started the book. And I decided before I started the book to describe the battle from the perspective of a French ship of war. And I had to contrive a way in which Nathan would be aboard that ship. I won't go into it now because it will spoil a lot of the story. How does he give an eyewitness account of the battle from a French ship of war? And the ship I chose was the Redoutable, partly because mm. I'd spoken to one of the descendants of Captain Lucas, who was the captain of the Redoutable, uh, oh, which wow. was fighting wow. the victory throughout the battle. It was side by side mm. for four, four hours of the battle. Um, the yard arms tied together. It was from the, the Redoutable that the shot was fired that killed Nelson. Uh, I knew a lot about what was happening aboard that ship, which I never used in Nelson's Trafalgar, by the way. No. So I wanted to do that. And I'm, as I say, I managed to contrive a plot situation where, where Nathan comes to be aboard. And, and so he does describe it as an eyewitness. Yeah, and in fantastic. a particular way, which again, I think, because a lot of but basically, I like directing. I, I find writing a, a chore a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I really have to force myself, and I do it as visually as possible. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a visual, the way I might film the battle, with a handheld camera, <laughs> yeah. uh, probably hiding under, well, in, in I will give something away, under a Dutch fire <laughs> engine. <laughs> okay. I don't know how that came into my head, but I read an awful lot about Dutch fire engines and their use on ships of the line in the period. I'm an expert at all these kind of very obscure nautical details. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, I think that, that that's a really good reason for us to pick the book up and, uh, and and get ahead to that part. I'm really fascinated. I'm about two thirds of the way through the book at the minute, and I haven't got to Trafalgar yet. I'm right. getting there. By the way, I'm, I'm really enjoying the duality of the characters. All, all these contrasts, we've got Nathan and Sir Sidney Smith. We've also got Nathan and his colleague Tully, I think, aboard the ship, the Falaise. Uh, we've got the, the Smith showing up with his sidekick, French sidekick, Cadoodle, which is, by the way, a great name. I'm not sure if that's how you, how a French person would pronounce it. Apart from the kind of obvious parallels with the uh, pairs of characters in Patrick O'Brien, what is it about writing 
pairs of characters, friendships like this, that's so appealing? Actually, you know, I don't know that I, did, I hadn't really thought about it. Um, I think that you're right. It is appealing, and it's in so much other literature. And in, of course, I'm just thinking about it now. Uh, I, I mean, Smith and Cadoodle were real people. So Sidney Smith and uh, Cadoodle, I, I think it was, it's a funny name in English, but it means the warrior who returns home in Breton. Oh, yeah. And he was a very famous uh, resistance fighter to the revolution. Um, but um, uh, I, I did that. I definitely wrote him as a foil to Smith, and I think that's yeah. quite useful in characters when one is a foil. So that you've got the sardonic voice of Smith and this rather bemused yeah. Breton, who's being yeah. led along by Smith in ways that he might resist otherwise. Uh, I, I don't, but I honestly don't know why it's such a good literary device. I mean, obviously, with Aubrey and Maturin, it's two sides maybe of the author's yeah. character. But uh, and it certainly works. Um, you don't get it in Hornblower, do you? You get it to some yeah. extent in his number one, but not yeah, in quite as much. Yeah. So I like it. Yeah, I like it when it happens. Uh, and, and I've got some conversations in the other books too between Tully and and, and Nathan Peake, where again you get well in, in this particular case you probably get. Um, Nathan Peake being rather bemused because he's often getting yes. in, in situations which he doesn't understand. And, and perhaps that gives me another idea. You know how much in Patrick O'Brien you can educate the reader by by the ignorance of Maturin, which is wonderful, yeah, a I, wonderful I, ongoing I joke. But his naval ignorance is beautiful and you can get things explained that, that way. So maybe it is a device, but I can't say that it was intentional. Uh, well, and in that in that case, let's just say that it works really well and it makes me really it adds to the enjoyment of the whole story. Oh, so nice job. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Paul, we've talked a little bit about, you know, your thoughts about the Patrick O'Brien books as a writer, perhaps even as a director. Any additional thoughts there? How do you find the O'Brien books? Thinking about you've talked a little bit about kind of your writing and being intentionally different than O'Brien's a little bit. I think um I mean there are two things there. One is my pleasure uh, uh, as a reader of Patrick O'Brien, where I don't stop to think too much. I get caught up in it. I love the characters more than anything else. He does often doesn't bother with the plot right. quite so much. It, it just happens. They're all journeys, you know. So um, I, I really enjoy going along with those journeys, and I, I love all, all the characters, I think. Well, uh, pro apart from perhaps Ledbur and, and Ray, apart from the villains. But... Um, <laughs> But, but I love the characters aboard the ship, and they're a family. And I think the reader involved enough certainly feels a part of that. I love the characters on land, Diane Villiers and um, Sophie, Aubrey's wife, the whole home life that, that is there. It's not all at sea. So there is all of that going on as a reader, as a writer. I think I probably feel challenged by this idea of the voice again. Patrick O'Brien once said that it took him a while to catch on with the American audience because they were expecting a very Brit-centric series of naval tales and thought that that would sort of exclude them, whereas his ultimate core audience was different. It wasn't just the Brits and it wasn't even necessarily just men. Who are you thinking of in your mind as your audience when you're writing? And, and maybe tell us a little bit about who, who turns out to be in your audience, but we might not realise it. Yeah, I think I, I, I think about the American audience more than the British Right. And I don't know why that is, possibly because of the genesis of the idea of, a, of an American agent. And I have a lot more correspondence with American readers, too. So there is that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that I understood, I don't know if it's true, that Patrick O'Brien was more popular in America than he was in England initially. Yeah. I've heard uh, that that may have been one of the reasons why he leapt forward to the um, American-English War of uh, 1812 to 14. Yeah. So that he skips a few years and then compresses a lot of books into those two years. He brings Americans into the story, not not always yeah. sympathetically. There's that guy, the spy, Johnson is his name, who's right. mm -hmm. yeah, who's, who's, who's a nasty bit of work. But right. but you know, when there's another one where the Americans and the British get caught on an island together, and it's great stuff. Uh, I, I I did American history at university and specialized in the uh uh, American War of Independence and the, the making of the federal constitution. So I was steeped in that kind of American history. And so I identify a lot of my readers as the people I know personally who corresponded to me about this. But on the other hand, 
there was a time when Headline were publishing the first six books in England. We had a lot of discussions about the number of women readers, and they did hmm. do focus groups on, on, on the women readers. And, and it was an interesting thing for the genre in that there was some very interesting stuff came out from the women focus groups. And as a result, a Headline decided to redesign the book covers, which were very hmm. masculine uh, beforehand. Uh, uh, but then it was vetoed uh, at some point in the hierarchy because they didn't want to lose the older male readers. Mm. And I do think probably uh, the C genre has a lot of older readers. I think it is a pity that it can be exclusive of of younger readers and of particularly of, of women readers. And I think I'm sort of at the moment, I'm in defiance of it, particularly with the <laughs> book I'm writing at the moment. And I say uh, your your interview with Rachel, Rachel, Rachel McMillan. McMillan. Yeah. Rachel McMillan. Uh, that really helped in that, actually. Yeah. Oh, she's, I'm glad. She's phenomenal. She is mm. just phenomenal, and 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 a huge lover of Patrick of Rye, clearly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the genre, and and we find a lot of our listeners are women, and you know we have great conversations about how and why they love the book. So that's mm. uh. It's, it's been a personal mission of mine to try to introduce more women around the States here as, as I meet them to Patrick O'Brien. I'm glad to hear you doing that. One of the things we talked about with Rachel and, and a little bit with you before, Paul, and always fascinated by with any writer, your writing process. Can you tell us a little bit about what's that like and how you do that? I'm just laughing now because I'm, I'm in Brussels at the moment. And my writing process, is I think I, I like to write on the move. Okay, um, and I think that's partly writing a lot of scripts and screenplays, you know, so that uh, I'll be writing as we're filming quite a lot, changing mm. things, admittedly. But I like moving. I like writing on trains, going ah. somewhere. Uh, uh, I like writing in restaurants, and there's movement and action around me. I have because I worked as a journalist um, for about five years. Uh, you can wipe out everything that's going around you. It just becomes white noise. And, and it doesn't stop you concentrating, and I like that. When I was teaching creative writing at an English university for um, a term, I, I remember telling them to try to create a space for themselves, a bit like a film production office, where you have the storyboard around you, so that yeah. when I am writing, I'm putting it on laptop, because I tend to write in an exercise book when I'm on the move. It's easier, mm. and also it, I think the writing is better. Mm. I'm doing that at the moment. I've got it here in front of me. And um, uh, 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 and when I do put it on the laptop, I like to then have the pictures all, all around me and to feel that I'm yeah. immersed in the world visually. And uh, and it also, uh, I, I used to tell the students this, that you know you have to get yourself in that driving seat again. And sometimes it's hard. And if you yeah. can move back into the world you've created and you've created a visual world like it, it's not so difficult. You, you know, you slip back into it more easily if there's a visual reproduction of it around. I've just taken down all the storyboards for Trafalgar before I came over here uh, to Belgium and um, it, 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 uh, it upset me. Paul, you're obviously someone who loves fiction as well as nonfiction, so a lover of history too. Um, I'm very curious then to wonder if such a thing exists. What's on your to-read pile at the moment? If we were going to see the stack of books that you've got coming up, what might we find there? Well, uh, while I'm writing, and I've got to finish book nine by August, uh, oh I, try, I try not to write novels in case I lose the voice um, or I get diverted into another voice. Uh, and I, I tend to read factual books. Um, which won't be a great deal of interest to your listeners, but um, uh, unless they're writing themselves, I think. Uh, mm. So, but what I will say that I think is more interesting is that I've made an exception this time with Clarissa Oakes because I decided oh. to I would read that again and hopefully avoid that the plagiarism of writing like O'Brien. I don't think I could write like O'Brien anyway, but you don't want huh, you don't want the voice coming in and doing a, a second-rate job. But I will read Clarissa Oakes. I've also Got one. I, had, uh, I brought with me actually to Belgium just to, to relax sometimes. Uh, if I do read any novels, this is called *The Colony of Good Hope* by Kim Lean, and it's it's. Mm. If I do re read novels, it tends to be of the period, and yep. this is of the period, and it's about uh, a Danish settlement 
uh, on on green. It's about the voyage to Greenland uh, from Denmark oh, wow. and the things that happen on the ship and the settlements. So th- those things will help feed my imagination. Hopefully, the voice doesn't become a problem. If it does, I, I usually have to stop reading. If I find it coming into my writing, <laughs> it's a very difficult thing. But otherwise, I'm reading. Um, various technical things like you know french warship crews 1789 to 1805 which is fascinating i wonder if you knew that the word for the boy sailors in french was moose which means snots (laughs) not unlike the snotties uh, the the british midshipmen yeah still 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 the same word used i think sometimes as well wow fascinating i wonder what the common root must be for all of that Fascinating. <laughs> well, we, we can't keep you from that too much longer, hey, Mike? No, that's right. That's right. Well, Paul, you said you're, you're working on number nine now. And um, what else? What's next for you creatively? Well, I did have, uh, uh, I think, accidentally over COVID, I had um, a break of two years in the Nathan Peaks. And I wrote a contemporary novel called The Vatican Candidate uh, because it was, again, a follow-up from a film, a couple of films that I'd done. And uh, it was set in the present day, but it relates to something that happened in the last week of the World War II. So uh, that's being billed. Uh, again, it's a duo. Uh, you guys have put this in. That's because you're a duo yourself <laughs> into my head, but this is a duo. It's uh, two people who come together to try to solve a series of murders and it's being billed as a Harper Blake, Harper and Blake mystery. So I'm hoping to do more of them. That's the pilot for them. So that uh, I guess it depends, really. It depends on Nathan Peake. Uh, you don't know quite when I run out of well, steam is the wrong word in the age of sale, but <laughs> with Nathan. Um, and after Trafalgar, there's a there is a sense of anticlimax. I'm hoping the Peak Nine won't be an anticlimax because I discovered lots of things that happened in 1806 at sea. You know, the war very much went on, but you never know. Right. Right. And and how about if, if people want to connect with you online, want to catch up, want to follow what you're doing? You know, what are the best, uh, you know, th- their best options for social media or? Uh, I guess I guess the website, which is um, www.paulryers.com. And you can find it with Nathan, NathanPeak.com and um, SethHunterBooks.com. Uh, there's also um, something that uh, social media campaigners that I I work with in the States, um, set up on Facebook, which is the Nathan Peak novels on Facebook. Mm. And that tells you about every individual novel and some of the background to them as well. So I guess that's the best. Well, Fantastic. Paul, I, I know for me, you know, I, 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 we mentioned this once before, the last thing I needed in my life right now was another series of novels that I had to read. But, you know, having having tasted the first and Trafalgar, now I'm now I'm hooked. So, you know, I, I highly recommend it to our listeners as well. You know, and, and we really, really appreciate your time with us. Well, I very much appreciate your interest and I'll be following you on Lover's Hole. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to, to all those connections in the future. Thanks once again. Really great to talk to you today, Paul. Thank you. Boy, what a great talk with Paul. What fabulous books. I think, you know, we see so many times on the Facebook groups and everything, you know, what do I read after O'Brien? Well, here you go. Seth Hunter, you know, the Nathan Peake series, outstanding. Really loved that talk. And I'm hoping we're going to come back soon with more of a review of this Trafalgar Fog of War and a discussion with a little bit more from the world of nautical fiction publishing in a future interview. Yeah, great. We're looking forward to that, looking forward to bringing it to you. Um, Looking forward as well to the beginning of the next book, The Commodore. But first, Mike, let's just take a look back at where we've been reading The Wine Dark Sea. I've I've really enjoyed so much about the book. I've enjoyed the themes, uh, the uh, travel. I've enjoyed the dark kind of personal drama for Stephen. And this final chapter was fun, but a, a bit unusual, a bit out of character for some of the ways that we've normally got used to O'Brien wrapping up his stories here. Yeah, it really has been all of the jeopardy that you know we kept sort of seeing and then backing off and then getting in more jeopardy. And, and it almost seemed like 
uh, kind of a rehash in some places, although well written, as he always does, a rehash of, you know, kind of some of O'Brien's greatest hits, lightning, icebergs, fog, shooting gap to get away from an enemy ship. And uh, it's a a bit of an anti-climax, all those books getting to this great mission in South America, a mission for which we have some great Cochrane precedent. And I couldn't help but wondering myself is, you know, O'Brien's really hitting his stride. He's now got a big readership. He's getting paid the big bucks. Is he maybe resting on his laurels just a little bit? Well, it's fascinating. At the end of the audio book, the Recorded Books Inc. audio book with Patrick Tull narrating, there's the final part of an interview with Patrick O'Brien talking about the research and talking about how the consequence of all these many years of prior research were that so much of it was now pretty much within his reach. Well, actually, for, for, as far as research goes, I do little or none at present, because for 50 years, indeed for more than 50 years, I've read deep into naval matters of that period and of earlier periods, and I have a very great deal stored in my mind. I do have masses of notes of my earlier reading, and I have all the necessary reference books. So, do you see, I don't have to pause and think and go back to, for example, public records office and admiralty records, because I've, I've got pretty nearly all I need. So I, I'm, I'm with you, Mike. I, I think that there are some things in this chapter that he just reached for because he knew he could kind of pick them up and put them in place here. And I can't criticize him for doing that. He's written all these really awesomely researched books. I think he's earned the right to be able to reach into things that are now familiar to him. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of noticing it a little bit and, and wishing for still more of the invention and still more of the innovation that we had earlier on in the story. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Ian. And there were some great opportunities to do so that kind yeah. of lent themselves as, as a part of the story. I mean, I really wanted more of that detail of Stephen's trip through the mountains and, yeah. and getting back down and, you know, in the Peruvian chair and over the bridges and, you know, how did they get out of the dock in Peru? How did they get passage to Valparaiso? You know, there was a great story there, but it wasn't kind of in the old greatest hits thing. He had done such a great job with the high endies. Can't fault him with that. Yeah. But would love to have heard some more about that, as well as I said, you know, this whole um, fight for independence in Peru and especially Chile. Yeah. <laughs> We've got so much on Chile in real life here. Yeah. And there's, but, a, there's a Cochrane yeah. story to be told waiting. Yeah. Absolutely. And and all this is, okay, we've gone how many books now? And Detour gets loose and that's it. Game over, right? Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Well, well, we'll see. Let's say that we've still got a few books left in the canon. And there's still a chance for us to revisit some of these things. Part of me is being careful about spoilers and part of me has genuinely forgotten about how much more of these story arcs we're going to come across. Let's see as we keep reading the books. Meanwhile, I, I'm going to pay tribute in, even so to some of the really great descriptive writing in this book. I remember yeah. loving the, the the actual wine dark actual sea with the volcano at the beginning. We've had the Antarctic sea. We've had sky and ice. We've had all of this behavioral and internal dramatic writing about Stephen and, and the other characters as well. Like Jack, though, maybe it's, it's, it's really time to say we are hoping to get home. And uh, I wonder if we'll actually get to do that next week with the Commodore sitting waiting for us on the shelf. Well, there's only one way to find out, Ian. What do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. <laughs> Isidore wrote a seventh century et- a seventh century etymology. Et- <laughs> Today is a tiny rich Sam. environment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a seventh century etym- etymology. Podcasts are like sausages. You don't want to see them getting made. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. This is terrible.